to the cellar. Welcome back to the cellar. Today's video is another collection of horrible fates. For this collection, I have included 12 stories involving all sorts of situations which ultimately led to horrible endings. I want to make it really clear to everyone, as I have on my prior collection videos, that these are not new stories. This is simply a collection of some of my most recent stories covered within the channel. You may ask the question of why you reuse content. Well, to put it simply, I have a lot of fans and supporters of the channel that wait until I put out these larger format collections. These tend to be the most popular videos on the channel, and they bring in a ton of new subscribers to help the channel continue to grow. I just wanted to make sure that I made that clear before we got the video started. This collection is the largest I have put together yet, and I really do hope you all enjoy the stories. Thank you very much. Now, I'm sure many of you remember the Backstreet Boys, the boy band that at one point ruled the world alongside NSYNC, Britney Spears, and Christina Aguilera. I certainly remember them well, as my younger sister was obsessed with them growing up. For this particular story, we're going to be talking about Aaron Carter, the younger brother of Backstreet Boys member Nick Carter. Aaron Carter was born December 7, 1987 in Tampa, Florida. At the young age of seven, Aaron would begin performing, following along in the footsteps of his older brother. By age nine, Aaron would release his self-titled album, which would go on to sell over a million copies worldwide. A little side story, I actually remember traveling to a local Walmart in upstate New York to see Aaron Carter and the boy band Dream Street perform. I honestly couldn't tell you what year it was, but the concert was held in the Walmart Garden Center. Being that my sister was a huge fan at the time, my parents decided we would all go together to watch them perform. I honestly don't remember much about it, but I do remember how quickly Aaron Carter went from being on top of the world to seemingly forgotten within the music scene. His second album would go on to sell more than 3 million copies in the US, and he would go on tour alongside his brother. Aaron would go on to release a third album, which would also go platinum, but by the release of his fourth album, sales would plummet, and he wouldn't release a full album for over 15 years. Now, I'm not going to do a complete deep dive into Aaron's life, but it's easy to say that it was tumultuous at best. There were lawsuits filed against his parents and against his former manager, Lou Perlman. Lou Perlman could be the source of his own story here on the channel as the man was the genius behind the two biggest boy bands of that era, NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. But he was also a schemer, who did a lot of horrible things that I won't get too far into. If you want to know more about Lou Pearlman, I recommend you watch Lance Bass's documentary titled The Boy Band Con, The Lou Pearlman Story. Also, if you guys are interested in me uh, covering the topic, let me know in the comment section below, and I could make that a future video. Aaron Carter would tour periodically over the next decade plus, while also being a part of Dancing with the Stars' ninth season. The darker side of what Aaron Carter's life had become would begin to show more and more throughout the 2010s as he would go through numerous stints in different rehab centers. We haven't really talked about the Huffy. Right. No, and it's, that, and it, that's it's something, something that... I, I've kept secret from the whole world until now. I lied to you. I said, I just told you the truth. Huffing was what I was doing. That's why I have gabapentin and I have to take fish oil. Okay. Because I have to repair the serotonin and the receptors in my brain. I want to ask you the huffing when it started, how often you were doing it, what you were huffing. Didn't really touch it until I was about 23, right after I did Dancing with the Stars. And I started going to Staples and Office Depot and different places, buying it with cash so it wouldn't be reported on receipts or anything like that. I was huffing because, because I was really stupid and sad. From 2014 to 2022, Aaron would begin touring and releasing music again more regularly, with his last album, Blacklisted, being released on November 7th of 2022. 
That now brings us to November 5th of 2022 at Aaron's home in Lancaster, California. At the age of 34, and after at least five prior rehab stints, Aaron was still struggling with substance abuse issues. Now, we don't know exactly how everything played out as no one was there with him, but based on reports and the subsequent investigation, we can piece together an idea of what transpired. At some point during the day of November 5th, 2022, Aaron would proceed to take a pill known as Alprazolam. Alprazolam is the generic form of Xanax. Following his ingestion of said pill, Aaron would begin huffing some form of difluorothane. Difluorothane is commonly found in various household aerosol products, including cans of aerosol keyboard cleaners or computer dusters. The gas can be huffed to get a high, but the effects from it can cause cardiomyopathy, angioedema, respiratory stridor, and loss of consciousness. Mixing both of these things can be a dangerous combination, but it is made even more so dangerous when you do so and proceed to get into a bathtub full of water, which is exactly what Aaron would do. The belief is that he was trying to relax and get high at the same time. The combination of both drugs in his system would soon take effect and Aaron would lose consciousness while his head slowly slipped beneath the surface of the water. Sadly, it wouldn't be until some time later that a housekeeper of Aaron's would stumble upon his lifeless body in the now cold water of his bathtub. Emergency services would be called, but there was nothing they could do. Aaron Carter had drowned. I would say this is simply a horrible way to leave this world, but at the same time, it may also be one of the more peaceful fates we have covered on the channel. Since no one was present at the time, it's not fully known how exactly everything transpired, but it's believed that after he lost consciousness, he simply never regained it. Now, after digging deeper into the story, there are theories and those out there that don't buy into Aaron's death as being an accident. In fact, there's an entire theory that he was murdered. Following the death of Aaron Carter, his mother would post pictures taken of the bathtub and the state in which the bathroom was in following the discovery of Aaron's body. His mother stated that she posted the photos because the police never took his death seriously. They never investigated a potential homicide taking place, simply because of his past history with drugs. As I looked at all the evidence, I was left wondering if maybe this was no accident. According to reports, Aaron had received numerous death threats. Could someone have killed him and set things up to make it look like an accident? I don't have the answers, but I can say this much. The police don't always get things right. If what Aaron's mother has stated is true, and the scene of his death was never properly contained and looked over, then there's very well a possibility that something more sinister occurred. Either way, a young, talented but troubled life was lost, and my condolences go out to the entire Carter family. Dolores Marie Eileen O'Riordan was born on September 6, 1971, in Ballybricken in County Limerick, Ireland. It is said that Dolores was singing before she could even speak, a talent and passion she had from the moment she could start vocalizing. Traditional Irish music was her first love and genre. She would go on to sing in school and in church choir over the years, but at the age of eight, her life would take a dark turn as she was abused for four years by a person who was a trusted and well-known figure within her Limerick community. The effects of this abuse would haunt her for most of her life. As Dolores hit her teenage years, she would continue singing while also spending numerous years learning how to play piano. At age 17, she would pick up a guitar and begin playing solo gigs. In 1989, the band The Cranberry Saw Us was formed. Brothers Mike and Noel Hogan formed the band alongside Fergal Lawler and their singer at the time, Niall Quinn. 
Less than a year later, the band's singer would leave, and thus the search for a replacement was underway. Dolores' name was brought up as she was a friend of one of the band member's girlfriends. She would eventually come to one of the band's practices where she would show off her singing chops. The band would hand her a cassette of instrumentals and ask her to work on writing vocal parts for the songs. She would eventually return with a roughly put together version of the song Linger. Upon hearing this, the band immediately hired her. They knew Dolores was a special kind of singer. Over the next year, the band would write, record, and release music while touring under the new band name, The Cranberries. They would eventually get noticed by numerous labels, and in 1992, Island Records would sign the band, and they would go into the studio to create their first full-length album. The band would release Everybody Else Is Doing It, So Why Can't We in 1993. It contained the songs Dreams and Linger, which were two of the band's most successful. The album would go on to chart at number 8 on the Billboard Hot 100. Dolores and the Cranberries were now in the mainstream. Now, since this story isn't a documentary about the band, I won't dive into too much more. I'm certain many of you have heard of the Cranberries, or at the very least know the songs like Dreams, Linger, or the smash hit Zombie. Over the next two decades, Dolores would continue to write and play music. Some of those years were spent with the Cranberries, and some of those years she spent working on and playing solo. During that time, Dolores would struggle with depression. She put a lot of pressure on herself, and was eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2015. To add to her troubles, Dolores would suffer from excruciating back problems, a problem that would linger and cause her to dive further into a spiral with alcohol. I found a quote from Dolores that was posted on irishcentral.com that I felt really encapsulated what she was struggling with. It read, I am pretty good, but sometimes I hit the bottle. Everything is way worse the next morning. I chain smoke when I drink. I have a bad day when I have bad memories and I can't control them and I hit the bottle. I kind of binge drink. That is kind of my biggest flaw at the moment. That ultimately brings us to Monday, January 15th, 2018. Dolores was staying in a hotel in London and had plans to record some vocals the following morning. The band Bad Wolves was in the process of recording a cover of the Cranberry smash hit, Zombie, and they had reached out not only for Dolores' blessing, but to see if she wanted to sing on the track. Dolores was seemingly excited to be involved with the song, and the following day she had all plans to head over to the recording studio to lay down her vocals. Now, it's unclear what Dolores was dealing with on the night of Monday, January 15th. It could have been the pain in her back, or it could have been the dark depression that she had been battling for decades at this point. Whatever it was, it led her to drinking inside that hotel room. It was reported that five miniature bottles of alcohol, as well as a bottle of champagne, were found in Dolores' hotel room. On top of that, a container of prescription drugs was found but after a full toxicology report came back, it showed that only therapeutic amounts of the medication was found within her bloodstream. Her bloodstream that had alcohol levels that were more than four times the legal driving limit. Similar to Aaron's story, it's believed that Dolores began drinking and she eventually made herself a hot bath and proceeded to climb in. It's unclear how it all transpired but at some point, a highly intoxicated Dolores would most likely pass out. Her head would slowly slip beneath the water in the tub, and she would drown. The 46-year-old would leave behind three children and countless hours of amazing music that will live on well into the future. From Aaron Carter, to Dolores Riordan, to Jim Morrison, and the most recent Matthew Perry, all these high-profile people would slip away while in a bathtub. For most, taking a bath isn't viewed as being anywhere near the top of our most dangerous things we could do list. But when you mix drugs, alcohol, or other substances, you put yourself at further risk no matter what the situation is. I myself lost a friend years ago to an absolutely horrible suicide. I won't get into the details, 
but life can be a struggle for us all. Some of us get the help we need, while others self-medicate to take the pain away. I hope that in sharing these stories, it acts as a reminder of how fragile life can be. If you are someone struggling with addiction or depression or anything of that nature, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Asking for help is not a weakness. The real strength lies in admitting that you have a problem and making the decision that you are determined to do something about it. If you do need help, I will leave a link in the description box below that has a list of helplines no matter what country you may live in. This first story takes place in Massachusetts. An unidentified 54-year-old man who worked a labor-intensive job in construction and had no prior health issues suddenly collapsed inside a McDonald's restaurant and was immediately rushed to the hospital. When arriving at the hospital, the man had lost consciousness and 24 hours later, he would pass away. So what happened? How does a perfectly healthy 54-year-old just collapse and die? Well, the culprit happens to be something that many people consume and never think twice about the effects it can have on the body. Let's dive into it all. As I stated prior, the man worked a labor-intensive job in construction and had done so for a large portion of his life. Prior to the incident, he had been given a clean bill of health at his doctor's office. On top of working a labor-intensive job, the man would walk his dog numerous times a day with no issue. Now in digging into the story, I did find that the man didn't have the healthiest eating habits. That was according to his family and his doctor. The man also smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, a long-running habit that isn't good for anyone. Outside of this, the man's only other daily habit was red licorice an item that he would consume on a daily basis and had consumed for quite some time with no issue. Now, at around three weeks prior to the man's untimely demise, he would make a crucial mistake, one that I myself or anyone could make without even giving it a second thought. So what did the man do? Well, he simply switched from a red licorice to a black licorice. Sounds pretty harmless, right? Well. The man consumed roughly one to two bags of licorice a day. When he made the change to black licorice, he continued the habit, just like he had been doing for quite some time. The only problem with this is that black licorice contains glycerizic acid. Glycerizic acid is the chief sweet tasting constituent of Glyceriza glabra root. Structurally, It is a saponin used as an emulsifier and gel forming agent in foodstuffs and cosmetics. To put it as simply as I can, glycerizic acid is widely applied in foods as a natural sweetener. Also medically, the ingredient can be used to positive effect. It has been studied for its medicinal properties. This powerful phytochemical has been proven to reduce body fat, heal stomach ulcers, and fight infections. But in large amounts, glycerizin causes a condition called pseudoaldosteronism, which can cause a person to become overly sensitive to a hormone in the adrenal cortex. This condition can lead to fatigue, high blood pressure, sodium retention, potassium loss, and even heart attacks. As the man began consuming package after package of black licorice, his potassium levels steadily plummeted. As he was standing in that McDonald's restaurant, his potassium levels continued to plummet, which subsequently caused a heart arrhythmia. With his heart acting erratic, the man's body could no longer function as it needed to. The man began shaking, 
and then he would subsequently collapse and lose consciousness within the restaurant while onlookers called 911. The ambulance would soon arrive and they would begin performing CPR before transporting the man to a local hospital. Once at the hospital, doctors were forced to place the man on a ventilator and he would be admitted to the cardiac ICU. All efforts were soon made to try and save the man, but around 24 hours later, he would die due to cardiac arrest. His body simply couldn't function any longer due to the damage that had been done. Following his death, researchers would put a lot of time and effort into this case, and they would ultimately determine the cause of his death to stem from the black licorice. A candy that each and every one of us could run to the store right now to purchase. Now, most of us don't eat two bags of licorice a day, so I'm not telling anyone to stop eating licorice. In fact, in moderation, black licorice can have some positive effects on the body, as I stated before. Just practice moderation, like your life depends on it. Alexandra Udina was a 23-year-old medical student who lived in Moscow, Russia. She had worked hard and had graduated college, earning her degree as a paramedic doctor. At 23 years young, she had seemingly a ton of life left before her. It was February of 2020. Alexandra and a group of her friends decided to spend an evening dancing, drinking, and overall having a good time at the Killfish Bar in Moscow. As the night progressed, the bar had an eating contest also being held. This eating contest was to have contestants consume three choco pies, a chocolate cake with marshmallow filling. According to her friends, Alexandra had no initial intentions in participating in the contest. But as the contest was getting set to begin, Alexandra changed her mind and decided to join in on the festivities. Alexandra, along with the other contestants, would each be given a plate with three choco pies. As the contest began, she consumed the first pie with absolute ease. As she looked down at her plate, she decided she would attempt to consume the last two pies at the same time in order to get an edge on her competitors. She would then proceed to consume the two pies when she would suddenly stop. She would bring both hands up to her mouth and then her left hand would begin patting on her chest in an effort to get the large amount of food to go down her throat. Not being able to swallow the food properly, Alexandra would start walking towards the bathroom within the bar. As she proceeded to do so, a photographer continued taking pictures of her and the other contestants. Alexandra would not make it to the bathroom, as she suddenly became unsteady on her feet. A person standing next to her would try to catch her, but she would soon collapse straight to the ground. On the ground, Alexandra would gasp for air, her mouth still full of pie, causing her windpipe to become blocked. Staff at the bar, along with her friends, would rush to her aid, desperately trying to clear her mouth and windpipe so that she could get some much needed oxygen into her lungs. But no matter how hard they tried, they could not clear her airway. Paramedics would soon be called to the scene. When they arrived, they too made an effort to save her life. But no matter how hard they tried, they could not get her airways to clear. She would be rushed to the hospital, where she would eventually be pronounced dead. In my research into this case, there were some reports that Alexandra had recently been diagnosed with leukemia. There hasn't been any official reporting as to whether or not this is the case, but some outlets reported that with this diagnosis, Alexandra was motivated to live life to the fullest and have as much fun as she could. Whether or not this was what ultimately motivated her to participate in the contest is just not known. Either way, a young, talented, 23-year-old lost her life because of a choco pie. What's even further tragic is the fact that the entire event was filmed and subsequently released to the public. Out of respect for her family, I will not play that video. It was 1974 on a rainy Halloween night in Deer Park, Texas. A man named Ronald Clark Bryan was out trick-or-treating with his two kids, eight-year-old Timothy and five-year-old Elizabeth. As the night progressed, 
one of their neighbors, Jim Bates, and his young son would soon join them. As the group went house to house through the neighborhood, they would soon approach a house with the lights off. The kids would run up to the door and bang on it, but no one would answer. Typically, the lights off mean the homeowners are not home, or they simply don't want to participate in the annual Halloween tradition. Once it became clear that no one was coming to the door, the kids began their stroll to the next house on their route. Jim Bates would follow along with the kids as Ronald seemingly hung back on his own. A short while later, as the kids continued collecting candy door to door, Ronald would reappear holding a handful of 21-inch pixie sticks. Pixie sticks are tubes of powdered sour candy. They're basically straight up tubes of sugar. According to Ronald, the house with the lights off had finally come to the door and provided the ever-sweet candy. Ronald would pass one to each of the kids, who were ecstatic to add the sugary sweet treat to their overall haul of candy. The rest of the night would go on as planned as the kids would continue going door to door and greeting each homeowner with a warm and welcoming trick or treat. As things grew late, Ronald and the kids parted ways with Jim and began their walk back home. As bedtime approached for the kids, each one was allowed to eat one treat from their haul of candy. Eight-year-old Timothy would look through all the delicious treats before he settled on the ever-enticing pixie stick. As Timothy attempted to eat it, he ran into an issue. The sugar was seemingly stuck in the straw. He asked his dad for help, and his dad was able to dislodge the blockage in the pixie stick. Timothy would begin consuming the sugary treat, but as he got his first mouthful down, he turned to his father and complained that it tasted awfully bitter. Timothy's dad ran and grabbed him a cup of Kool-Aid so that Timothy could wash the taste down. As Timothy finished his pixie stick, he subsequently got ready for bed, but it wouldn't be long before his stomach started hurting. Timothy began vomiting and was in excruciating amounts of pain. Before anything could be done, and only one hour after eating the pixie stick, Timothy was dead. Following the death of Timothy, an autopsy was done, and the results were shocking. Timothy had succumbed to cyanide poisoning. He had consumed a dose that was big enough to kill two people. Following this finding, the police were able to locate and obtain the rest of the pixie sticks. When they did, they found they had been tampered with and a staple was used to reseal the candy. Luckily, none of the other kids had consumed their pixie sticks at this point. But the police needed to get to the bottom of things. Who had tampered with and given out cyanide? The police would speak with Timothy's father, Ronald, in an effort to find out where the pixie sticks had been acquired. The first walk through the neighborhood yielded no answers as Ronald claimed he couldn't remember the house or even what the person looked like that had given him the pixie sticks. The police would not give up though, as they would turn the heat up on Ronald and proceed to walk him around the neighborhood a second time. This time Ronald was able to point out and give the police a house. The police would soon locate the homeowner at his place of work, placing him in handcuffs and bringing him into the police station. At the time, it appeared that the case had been solved, but upon interviewing the man in custody, it came to light that he had a solid alibi. The man had been working that night, and according to reports, his wife had been home but had ran out of candy. Upon running out, she turned off the lights and stopped answering the door. So if this man had not tampered with the candy, then who did? Well, it wouldn't take the cops long to put the pieces together. The police soon discovered that Ronald had recently taken out life insurance policies on both of his children. Furthering suspicion, Ronald owed over $100,000 in debt, and it was discovered that the morning after Timothy had died, Ronald had called the life insurance policy at 9 a.m. Following these revelations, the police were able to obtain a search warrant for Ronald's house. There they found a pair of scissors. The scissors had a plastic residue on them that was similar to the pixie sticks. Further investigation found that Ronald had recently asked one of his professors at college about which poison being the most effective. On top of this, 
a man who worked at a local chemical factory had remembered seeing a man wearing blue scrubs who had stopped in to acquire about purchasing cyanide. Ronald was an optician, and that was exactly what he would have been wearing for work. Ultimately, the man was unable to identify Ronald, but the police felt like they had enough to arrest and take Ronald to trial. On June 3rd of 1975, a jury found Ronald to be guilty of capital murder as well as four accounts of attempted murder. Ronald was ultimately sentenced to death. It would end up taking around nine years, but in March of 1984, Ronald was finally executed by lethal injection. How a man could do something like that to his own child, I simply could never understand. My condolences go out to all the families and friends of those in today's stories. Grana Padano is a cheese originating in the Po Valley in northern Italy. It is similar to Parmigiano Reggiano. Grana Padano was developed by monks of Cherival Abbey in the 12th century. The cheese can last a lengthy amount of time without spoiling. It is sometimes aged for up to two years. About 150 factories make Grana Padano within the Po Valley area. While an estimated 76,724 tons of this cheese gets manufactured on an annual basis. Why am I talking about cheese, you might ask? Well, this first story takes place within a warehouse located in Bergamo. Bergamo is an Italian city northeast of Milan in the Lombardy region. The warehouse was owned by 74-year-old Giacomo Chaparin. Giacomo was a local producer of Grana Padano cheese. Within his warehouse, thousands upon thousands of wheels of Grana Padano cheese was being stored. It was late in the evening of Sunday, August 6, 2023. Giacomo received an alarm from one of the machines that cleans and rotates the cheese wheels. This is not an uncommon problem, so upon receiving that alert, Giacomo and his son, Tiziano, headed over to the warehouse in order to adjust the wheel and get the machines back on track. According to reports, the pair arrived and managed to fix the machine. After doing so, Tiziano proceeded to leave the warehouse while his father worked on restarting the machine. Within moments of walking away from his father, a loud crashing sound could be heard. Tiziano immediately turned around and was horrified by what he saw. A 30-foot high shelf holding upwards of 15,000 cheese wheels had given way. Each of these cheese wheels weighs around 44 pounds. As the shelf gave way, an avalanche of cheese would crash through the warehouse, crushing and engulfing everything in its path, including Tiziano's father, Giacomo. Tiziano immediately attempted to uncover his father, but his efforts to move the cheese on his own got him nowhere. He would call emergency services, and over 20 firefighters arrived on scene. The situation was so dire that the firefighters had to call in a unit that specializes in the search and rescue of people from under rubble. They would spend hours moving the wheels by hand. It wasn't until almost 12 hours later that Giacomo's body was finally found. After 12 hours under the cheese, there was little hope that he would be found alive. As I researched the story, it was unclear what the cause of death ultimately was but it was believed to have been either due to asphyxiation or simply being crushed. Following the incident, Giacomo's son, Tiziano, expressed gratitude for being alive, as he stated that if he had walked away, even seconds later, then he too would have been crushed by the cheese. In the aftermath, it's believed that the accident had resulted in about $7.7 .7 million worth of damages including the cleaning equipment that was ultimately destroyed within the accident. As always, my condolences go out to Giacomo and all of his friends and family. Before we dive into the second story, we are first going to go over something that is used on a daily basis within the medical field. That something 
is an MRI. For those that don't know, Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or MRI, is a non-invasive medical imaging test that produces detailed images of almost every internal structure in the human body, including the organs, bones, muscles, and blood vessels. MRI scanners create images of the body using a very large magnet and radio waves. The strong magnetic field created by the MRI scanner causes the atoms within your body to align in the same direction. Radio waves are then sent from the MRI machine and move these atoms out of their original position. As the radio waves are turned off, the atoms return to their original position and send back radio signals. Needless to say, the magnetic field that is created by an MRI machine is extremely powerful. Now that you know all this, let's go ahead and dive into this next story. Leandro Matias de Noves was a 40-year-old lawyer from Brazil. On January 16, 2023, Leandro was accompanying his mother to the Cura Laboratory located in the central region of Sao Paulo, Brazil. His mother was there that day to have an MRI done for reasons that have not been reported. As the pair sat in the waiting room, those working at the lab informed the pair that nothing metallic could be brought into the room with the MRI machine. Prior to taking his mother back, the pair both signed documents acknowledging that no metal could be brought with them. Following this, the pair left what was believed to be everything they had on them that was metal behind. Leandro then proceeded to walk his mother back into the MRI suite. As he and his mother approached the machine, the unthinkable would occur. Unbeknownst to those that worked at the Cura Laboratory, Leandro was a big pro-gun advocate. He had a valid license and had registered his weapons properly. What he had not disclosed to those at the facility is that one of those weapons was tucked and concealed within his pants waistband. As Leandro approached the strong magnetic field, the weapon would get pulled from his waistband. It immediately went off, lodging a round straight into Leandro's gut. Alarmed by what just transpired, the workers at the facility quickly evacuated the room and dragged Leandro with them. They would immediately do all they could to get the bleeding under control, and Leandro was taken to a nearby hospital for surgery. For the next few weeks, Leandro would valiantly fight for his life. But on February 6th, around 22 days after the incident, Leandro would succumb to his wounds. An investigation into the incident found that staff at the facility had done everything they were supposed to prior to bringing Leandro and his mother back to the MRI machine. Please let this be a reminder that rules and regulations are in place for a reason especially within the medical field. I've seen numerous cases of people ignoring precautions with an MRI machine. The dangers that can come from such a decision can be harmful to not only yourself, but to those within the vicinity. As always, my condolences go out to Leandro and all of his friends and family. In Indian culture, Adi Belly means the Fridays that fall during the Tamil month of Adi from July to August. It glorifies various goddesses of the Hindu pantheon, and the festival marks the beginning of all festivals and is considered as an auspicious month. Adi Belly holds a special significance due to its association with the divine forms of goddess Shakti, celebrated on each of the five Fridays throughout the month. These Fridays are dedicated to the myriad of different manifestations of the goddess, each bestowing exceptional blessings upon her devotees. Adi Veli is an important festival celebrated across Tamil Nadu, where porridge is cooked and distributed to the public in honor of the goddess Aman. For further context, Tamil Nadu is the southernmost state of India. It is the 10th largest Indian state by area and the 6th largest by population. As the event and festivities went on, porridge was being cooked in large vessels. It was Friday, July 29, 2022. A 54-year-old man named Muthukumar was seen on video walking the streets. 
Near him sat numerous large pots of boiling porridge. Now, in order to stay within YouTube's guidelines, I won't be showing all of the footage from said event. But on video, you can see Muthukumar become seemingly dizzy, confused, and off balance. As he struggles to remain on his feet, he can be seen leaning against the edge of one of these large vats of porridge. As he rests against the edge, another man comes by and has an immediate realization that a dangerous occurrence is about to transpire. He sees how unsteady Muthukumar is. He immediately runs to get someone else to help him with Muthukumar. But before anyone can get back there to help, Muthukumar is seen falling backwards straight into the boiling hot porridge. Muthukumar's entire body becomes submerged in the thick, boiling liquid. Numerous onlookers try feverishly to get him out, burning themselves within the process. To be frank, the video is hard to watch. More and more people rush over to try and help, but with how submerged the man is, every one of them struggles to get a grip. It's hard to tell how long Muthukumar was left submerged, but from watching the video it appears like it takes anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds before the vat is finally knocked over and Muthukumar is freed. Following the incident, Muthukumar was taken to Rajaji Government Hospital, where he was admitted. It was later determined that around 65% of his body had suffered horrible burn injuries. He would fight for his life in the hospital, but sadly, only four days later, on August 2nd, Muthukumar would succumb to his injuries. The biggest question following his fate was what led to such a horrifying event. It's still unclear what made Muthukumar unsteady, leading to his fall into the porridge. But from reports, I did find that his wife stated he suffered from epilepsy. She believes this may have been the reasoning behind why he became dizzy and off balance prior to his fall. No matter what the reason, no one should have to suffer such a horrible fate. My condolences go out to Muthukumar's wife, family, and friends. It was October 31st, 2021, in Brasilândia de Minas, Brazil. Brasilândia de Minas, also known as Brazilian Dubai, is a municipality in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil. On this particular day, a 30-year-old man was out fishing at a lake with a few friends of his. Now, there isn't a ton of details with this story, so I'll do my best to convey what exactly transpired. From all reports, as the men continued fishing, a group of bees began swarming them. It's not clear if they disturbed a nest of some kind, but upon being attacked by these bees, the friends each dove into the lake water. One by one, each of the men would resurface and swim to safety. But it became apparent within minutes that something was wrong. The 30-year-old man had not resurfaced like all the others. This alarmed his friends, who immediately began searching the water and nearby land for their buddy. It wouldn't take long before emergency services arrived. Upon arrival, the firefighters began combing the water. It would take some time, but eventually one firefighter would locate the body of the missing man. It appeared first that he had drowned, but upon bringing the man to land, another horrifying discovery was made. Most of the man's face had seemingly been eaten. After attempting to search for more information, I could not find anything about the COD, but what was confirmed was that the man's face had been eaten by piranhas that lived within the lake. Whether or not he was consumed before or after drowning has never been verified. Either way, I can't imagine a more terrifying experience. I myself already have a phobia when it pertains to bees, so to go from a bee attack to jumping into a body of water and then being eaten by piranhas, it's easy to say that this man's fate seemed pretty determined on this day. As I always like to say, my condolences go out to the man and his family. It was Friday, August 24th, 2019, in the city of Orange, Texas. Orange is the easternmost city in Texas, located on the Sabine River, 
at the border with Louisiana. Orange is roughly 113 miles or 182 kilometers from Houston, Texas. The city's population hovers around 19,000 people. On this particular day, two of those residents were heading out to truly start their future together. Harley Morgan, age 19, and Rhiannon Boudreau, age 20, were both high school sweethearts. High school sweethearts that had been together since eighth grade and had finally made the decision to pull the trigger on making their union official. On what was a hot August day in Texas, the couple, along with the sister and mother of the groom, would travel to the Justice of the Peace courtroom located along Highway 87 South. The group would enter the courtroom and everything would go as planned, as they would say their vows and make their marriage official. The couple ultimately had future plans of having a bigger ceremony with friends and family. They wanted that particular ceremony to be around Christmas time, December 20th to be exact. But for now, they were both just ecstatic to finally be husband and wife. The group would soon exit the Justice of the Peace courthouse, chatting and laughing and overall enjoying such a happy and hopeful moment. The newlyweds would then proceed to get into their car, a small 2004 Chevrolet Cavalier, while the mother and sister of Harley, the groom, would climb into a separate vehicle. The couple would be the first to exit the Justice of the Peace. As they pulled out of the drive, they would attempt to merge onto Highway 87. That's when absolute tragedy would strike. As the couple pulled out and attempted to merge, a 2015 Ford F-250 pickup truck that was towing a trailer with a tractor on board would collide with the young couple's vehicle. Their car would begin to flip over and over numerous times before it finally came to rest in a ditch on the side of the road. Following right behind the couple was Harley Morgan's mother, who immediately exited her vehicle and ran straight to the wreckage. She would make a frantic effort to pull her son and his new bride out of the mangled wreck of a car, but no matter how hard she tried, she simply could not free them. Emergency services would soon arrive, and the couple was pronounced dead at the scene of the accident. As a matter of fact, the same Justice of the Peace, Joy Dubose Simonton, who moments earlier had presided over their nuptials, was the one to pronounce the young couple deceased. The driver of the pickup truck would not end up suffering any kind of serious injury in the accident. While further investigation by the police would point to Harley Morgan, the driver of the car, as being at fault, as it appears he did not yield the right of way to oncoming traffic. I will play some of the interview for you now that took place with Harley's mother following this tragic accident. The only thing that they wanted was to get married and start their life. The two of them had so many dreams. I watched my baby die. I'm still wearing my son's blood because I was trying my best to rip him him and her out of the car. Go home and hug your family tonight. If you have kids, go home and hug them because I don't have my kid. I don't have the one thing in my life that made me happy. I have to say that I wholeheartedly agree with Harley's mother. Even if you're mad, hug your family love your family. Even if they've made you mad, make amends. Don't go to bed angry because you don't know. You don't know how fast you can lose that person. I myself could not imagine losing either of my kids or my wife. This story is heartbreaking to say the least. So please let it be a reminder that life is fragile. So go hold your loved ones close. As always, my condolences go out to all the friends and family of Harley and Rhiannon. Morgan. What is trash streaming? For those of you that are unaware, trash streaming is a pretty straightforward idea that has become very popular in Russia. You invite some friends over for drinks, you live stream your party, and begin completing dares for donations from those watching your stream. It doesn't sound all that terrible, but when money is introduced into the equation, 
the stakes tend to get higher and increasingly more dangerous. The lengths that people will take things for the sake of getting paid can lead to despicable and outright deadly consequences. In today's story, we will be diving into the YouTuber Stas Reflay, whose real name is Stanislav Reshetnyak. Stas was a well-known Russian live streamer and YouTuber whose content was primarily focused on video game and live casino playing. As Stas continued to grow on the platform, he would soon dive headfirst into the trash streaming trend that was taking hold amongst Russian content creators. Stas became well known for abusing his girlfriend, Valentina Grigorieva, while live streaming. One live stream incident occurred when Stas was paid a sizable donation to pepper spray his girlfriend. His girlfriend could be seen on the stream having a panic attack, and instead of comforting her, Stas proceeds to pepper spray her. Valentina would then be seen sprawled out on the floor, moaning in agony. Another person that Stas was well known to pull numerous pranks on was Valentin Gnetchev. Valentin was reportedly a homeless man that suffered from alcoholism and possible mental illness. Stas would bait the man in by allowing him to stay within his house. Valentin would be seen on numerous live streams where viewers would place donations and request Stas to do disturbing things to the man, like convincing him to drink a cup of y- Valentin would later claim that he participated in everything willingly, and after three years of appearing on live streams, he would eventually leave and never come back. Now that you have a good idea of how depraved this man and his channel could be, we will fast forward to December 2nd, 2020. For context in this story, it was reported that it was negative 3 degrees Celsius or 17 degrees Fahrenheit. The reason I share this info will become more apparent as the story unfolds. Now, Stas was live streaming at the time with his girlfriend and a couple of friends of his. As the stream begins, they can all be seen drinking copious amounts while listening to music. As the stream continued on, a large donation of $1,000 would come in. The request was for Stas to his girlfriend Valentina and then lock her outside. It was immediately apparent that Valentina wanted nothing to do with this request as she would eventually pull out a knife and threaten to use it on Stas. Eventually, Stas would gain the upper hand on Valentina off camera. It's reported that Stas threw Valentina to the ground and removed most of her clothing. He then poured ice cold water on her and forced her outside into the cold. Following this horrifying turn of events, Stas would continue to stream. During the stream, Valentina can be here banging on the doors to be let back in. After some time, Stas would finally go out to check on his girlfriend. He would find her body lying on the balcony, unmoving. He proceeded to drag her back inside, trying to wake her up. He stated on the stream that she looked pale and wasn't breathing. He would proceed to carry her to the couch, and he finally called for an ambulance. Even more disturbing is the fact that he would continue to live stream for another 45 minutes. He drank and played music all the way up until the paramedics arrived. By that point, Valentina was no longer alive. It was originally believed that hypothermia was the culprit, but following an autopsy, it was concluded that her COD was caused by craniocerebral trauma, aka head trauma. Following an investigation, Stas was later arrested. He would be charged and convicted of involuntary manslaughter and was sentenced to six years in a maximum security prison. If you ask me, the man should have spent the rest of his life behind bars. In most cases, I try to cover the story as unbiased as possible, but in this case, I simply can't keep my mouth shut. After researching and diving into this, it becomes very evident that Stanislav Reshetnyak has no regard for human life. My deepest condolences go out to Valentina and all her family and friends. Hello everyone, this is me, Natural Selector 89, talking to you, friends and haters and everyone else. Um, I got this idea of making an introduction video to my channel 
since I already have uh, over 130 videos and not an introduction video yet, so I guess it's a good time to make one. <laughs> uh. Natural Selector 89, otherwise known as Pekka Ovenen, was born in Tusula, Finland. There is not a ton known about his early life, but from all reports it was pretty normal. He was a good student in school and was known as being relatively shy, often isolating himself from other students. According to some reports, he had been a victim of some long-term bullying, which led him to further isolate himself and become a well-known loner amongst his peers. Pekka would go on to make his first YouTube channel, Natural Selector 89, on March 15, 2007. A lot of his videos would revolve around things like natural disasters and shootings. Pekka would become well known for his strong belief in things such as communism, social Darwinism, and national socialism. He was also an atheist, a person who disbelieves or lacks belief in the existence of any god or gods. To put it plainly, Natural Selector 89 had all the telltale warning signs of an extremely troubled youth. He was a loner who believed in some extreme left and right wing ideologies. He had a fascination with school shits like Columbine. He also made videos that criticized and tried to disprove other religions and beliefs. Following a suspension of his first channel for unknown reasons, Pekka would go on to create a new YouTube channel called Sturmgeist89. This channel would follow the same trends that his first channel did. That was until he started posting videos showcasing his weapons. The red flags were all there for what was about to happen next. Pekka Avenen would post his last video called Jokola HS Massacre 11-7-2007. In the video, he displayed an image of the school, as well as two red filtered photos of himself holding a weapon. The song Stray Bullet by KMFDM was playing in the background. On November 7, 2007, Pekka Avenen would begin his ultimate plan. At approximately 11.40 a.m., Pekka entered Jokela High School's ground floor main hallway. He would proceed to walk through the school before he finally encountered a student within the corridor. With zero hesitation, Pekka pulled out his weapon and fired, extinguishing the first of many lives on that day. From there, he proceeded to a bathroom where he located and ended two more lives. At 11.47 a.m., the alert went out to the entire building that there was an active threat. Students and teachers began barricading themselves in rooms. Pekka would begin firing sporadically. 53 rounds went off within the school's corridors. At one point, he came upon a mother of a student at the school. For some reason, he decided to spare her before proceeding to the second floor where another life was extinguished. Pekka then began pouring two-stroke engine fuel down the hallway, but he struggled to ignite the liquid and soon gave up. Head teacher Helena Kalmi would exit the school at 11.54 a.m. She would eventually proceed to the car park in an effort to guide rescue vehicles into the area. Around the same time Pekka would exit the school, visibly angry and cursing to himself. He would encounter Helena, who calmly tried to talk Pekka into surrendering. At 11.57 a.m., the conversation ended with the sound of seven bangs. Pekka proceeded back into the school, banging on doors and trying to get into wherever he could, but his efforts would lead him nowhere. At 12.03 p.m., Pekka Avenen took position near the main entrance, refusing to negotiate his surrender. He would soon walk back into the bathroom near the canteen and proceeded to throw his jacket and bag onto the floor. He had no plans of being taken alive. At 12.04 p.m., the ordeal would finally come to an end with the sound of one final bang. Pekka was eventually located by police and was found to still be alive. He was transported to a nearby hospital where he would ultimately succumb to the fatal wound. When all was said and done, six students, a nurse, and the head teacher of the school 
had all lost their lives. The warning signs had all been there. If only something could have been done before such a horrifying event transpired. Pekka was clearly a troubled young man who had been reportedly bullied to no end. Even with that being the case, the actions that he took are beyond despicable. My condolences go out to all those that were affected by this traumatic and heartbreaking event. In stories like this, the perpetrator tends to be the source of the conversation and the name that's always remembered. So I wanted to take a moment to remember the names of all those that were lost on that fateful day. I apologize in advance if I butcher any of these names. Simile Nermi Mika Pateri Hulkinen Ari Juhani Paulsonen Hanna Katarina Laksonen Kinyanin Serka Aneli Karaka Miko Tapani Hiltonen Vili Valteri Heinenen Elena Tommy Thank you all for tuning in to another episode. If you enjoy my content, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, you can check the description box below and find the link to my merch store. Tons of awesome designs and the proceeds help fund the channel. For those of you that are interested, I have a Cellar Dwellers membership tier for the channel. It's only $2.99 a month. It comes with some pretty cool perks. So if that interests you, then please go ahead and check it out. I also have that linked in the description box below. If you'd like to submit a real-life scary story that you would like featured on an episode on the channel, please do so using the email or the Reddit link that is in the description box below. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself, so anything that you do to support the channel is greatly appreciated. Until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into the cellar.